as I was thinking about our lesson for this evening, thinking about, okay, here we are, New Year's Eve. Tomorrow is a new year. We've got all this waiting ahead of us. Sometimes, whenever we think about all that's waiting ahead of us, it can be kind of overwhelming a little bit. Because we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's ahead of us. We don't know what this next year has in store for us. What are we looking at in 2024? As I was, uh, we were talking in the, the foyer earlier, and I was thinking about my lesson, and, and Russell made the comment, he, he saw where 200 Christians in Kenya have lost their lives. Was that just recently? Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, 200 Christians were killed. And I thought about this sermon and I thought, what have I got to complain about? What have I got to complain about? Tonight's lesson is about the uncertainty certainty of the year that's coming at us. But then whenever I think about folks who are living in those conditions that really don't know whether they're going to live the next day. And I think about our situation, and, and I think about that's how we ought to live, as though we don't know whether we have another day. But going into this next year and facing the uncertainty of the things that are come, coming, you know, it, it's just another day, right? Tomorrow's just another day. Yeah, I think about that with birthdays and anniversaries, whenever you make those milestones in your lives, you know, you think, well, it's just another day. Yeah, I turned 50 in May. It's just another day, angel. <laughs> it's another day. But, it, but, you know, those milestones, they make you think, you know, they think, and, and we don't dwell on the past so much, we look forward. We're looking forward to see what's coming at us. Winston Churchill said, it is always wise to look ahead, but difficult to look further than you can see. Boy, isn't that true? Isn't that true? Turning your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. We are going to read just the, the first uh, verses of that chapter here in a moment, but I want you to think about the situation that is going on. Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they have been through a lot, have they not? And they have wandered for 40 years. You think about that. Moses being their leader for 40 years. We can hardly stand for with the same leader. You take that however you want it. But 40 years with the same leader, people have died off. Young ones have, I mean, you think about the little ones that were born in the wilderness that didn't even know anything about what was going on in Egypt. 40 years, that's a long time. And we get ready, get, they're getting ready to go into the promised land, and God says, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. And he takes his life before they enter. Well, there's got to be a new leader, doesn't there? There's got to be someone else that, that stands before God and, and stands before the people and is that kind of a go-between at that time. And, and can you imagine in the people's minds the uncertainty? Yes, Joshua has been there, but still, what kind of leader is he going to be? Let's read the first few verses of this as we, and we get into this lesson. Beginning in verse 1, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, 
And to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And so as they are getting ready to go into the land of Canaan, Joshua himself would be faced with uncertainty. What are we going to deal with when we get across the Jordan River? What are we going to have to face? How am I going to lead this great nation of people into battle of people who have never really fought? I mean, they've had a little skirmishes here and there, and we, we can see that. How am I going to do this? And so God talks to Joshua to encourage him, to help him with that uncertainty. They were going to face many challenges, but God encouraged him, you be of good courage. Be of good courage. And so as we look at the next three verses, what we find is God helps him to understand this is how you're going to go forward. And as I was reading that, I was thinking, this is how we need to go forward. This is what we need. As we are looking at 2024, this is how we need to deal with it. This is how we need to deal with every day that comes ahead of us that we don't know what's going to happen. Look at verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. See, Joshua needed to have courage as a new leader. But what God is saying is you need to have courage to do what I Told you. Do what is written in my law. Do what it is that I have commanded. He, had, being a military leader for the nation, uh, there would be things that would come at them. There would be temptations. There would be things that would draw them away from God. There would be things that God would say, You don't need to have a part in that. And they would be pulled away. And you know what? It's not long after they pass over the Jordan River that happens. You remember AI? that little town, and the problems that all of that caused. When we think about the uncertainty that Joshua would have faced, God is helping him step by step to understand this is what you need to do. Well, guess what? He's helping us too. And first and foremost, this new year requires for us to be strong and courageous to face whatever comes at us. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And you know where I'm going here, but we're going to read it anyhow. Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 10, Paul wrote, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. First and foremost, we need to understand that we are at war. We are at war. We have an adversary out there that wants to defeat us. And that is Satan. I believe it's in 2 Peter that he, he, Peter talks about how he is ro- you know, he's, he's prowling around. However, it, I can't even get the words out tonight. But you know what I'm talking about. Prowling around like a roaring lion. He's waiting. Waiting to devour us. You know, back in... Uh, Back in, back in the day, Revolutionary War Day, whenever they fought battles, they fought, they were, they were customarily, they would line up the army on one side. You young people may not know this. 
but they'd line up like one army would line up on one side and then another army would line up on the other side. And then what they'd do is then they'd all aim their guns at one time and all shoot at one time. Why did they do that? Because they couldn't hit the broad side of the barn. I mean, their guns weren't accurate. So you got to have that volley of bullets, you know. Well, as, it, as time went along and guns got a little bit better and they figured out that's not the best way to keep your soldiers alive, they stopped standing up there in a line like that. And then you have what's called guerrilla warfare where people are hiding in the bushes and they're, they're ambushing and all of these things. Well, guess what? That's how Satan is. He's not standing out there in front of you with his, you know, his feathers on his head and whatever to say, oh, here I am. You know, take your best shot. He's hiding in the bushes. He's hiding in the shadows. He is waiting to pounce on you whenever you least expect it. But if we will be strong in the Lord, we can defeat those things. If we will take on his armor, we can take care of those things. So resolve to be strong, not in your own strength, but in the strength of God. And that's doing His will. Whenever we go over to James and we read those, those verses about, uh, you know, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only, what he's talking about there is, you know what, you, you can hear what God wants to do, do all the time, but if you're not actually doing those things, it's not going to help you. We need to be doing those things that God wants us to do. Keeping His commandments, staying true to His word. And that leads me to my next point there in verse 8. We're back in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. God tells Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it day and night. <clears throat> that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For when you will make, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You know, Joshua needed to know the law. Of course, he needs to know what to do and what not to do, right? But he needs to know the way. Now, is that the same thing? Yes, absolutely. But God, through his word, showed Joshua, this is the way you operate, this is the way you lead your nation, this is the way you, you do things in this world. And he needed to meditate on that. Not only did he need to meditate on that, notice what it says there at the first part of that verse, it shall not depart from your mouth. You need to talk about it. Talk about the word of God. And so he's meditating on it, he is talking about the word, and <clears throat> he would have had to make that law his life. Make it his life. Not only does he need to make it his life, he needs to make it the life of those who are following him. You know, if you read through the, the you know, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, all of those things, and you read about the different kings that came along from time to time, what you find is the people followed the king, by and large. I mean, you know, if the king said, y'all need to get rid of all your idols and all of this stuff, what'd they do? Well, they got rid of all their idols and stuff. If the king said, I don't care, then what'd they do? They say, I don't care, I want to do what I want to do. And we have that back and forth with the kings. Well, it was important for whoever's leading the nation at the time to have that strength to, to stay in God's word, but not only to have that strength, but to have the will to teach them. To tell them what the word is talking about. The way through the new year for us is by the word of God. And I know we've talked about this over and over and over, but we need to get into God's word. I've been reading the Bible ever since I could read. Ever since I could read, I have been reading the Bible. Going to Bible classes, hearing lessons, you know, uh, from, the, from the pulpit and having my Bible there and looking at my Bible and reading my Bible and all this stuff. And you know what? I didn't learn a thing. Yes, learned a little bit along the way, but 
until you really start sitting down and studying it, you just don't get it. You just don't. So I'm going to encourage you to do that reading, the Bible reading, but let me tell you something, that's not enough. When you come across a section where, the, where you don't understand, okay, why is he saying that, then go and hunt and search and find out why is he saying that. What's the background to all of that? What's the culture that is dealing with that? What am I trying to say? Make it a part of your life. Go to 2 Timothy with me. 2 Timothy. We were in there this morning, 2 Timothy. Well, we're going to go up ahead of that a little bit. First part of the chapter. I want you to notice, now this is Paul talking to this young preacher. That's who he's talking to. But Paul says, beginning in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see what he's supposed to be doing? First of all, receive what Paul had given him. Paul had been teaching, Paul had been preaching the gospel, and Paul is saying, you you need to take that. Now, what do you do with that? You take that and you teach it to others who are able to also teach it to others. There's kind of a a reciprocal thing going on there. All right, look down in verses 7 through 10. He says, Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things, Remember that Jesus Christ, to the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And here Paul is saying, look, this is what I've, this is what I've been teaching you. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. And so you need, that's what you need to take. You need to take that and you need to make that a part of your life and then you need to share that with others. Go on down to verse 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I always like, the, new, the, the King James Version, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Now, I know that's not the right word, and you know it doesn't really get all of the, the meaning of that word. It is more along the lines of be diligent. The English Standard Version says do your best, and that's what we ought to be doing. That word carries with it, listen to me, a sense of urgency. That, that Greek word... It's not talking about, you know, whenever you get around to it, study it. When you get around to it, make it a part of your life. He's saying, get on it. Make this a part of your life. Because knowing the word and applying it keeps you from straying. Look at the next two verses. But shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. You see, if we don't want to stray concerning the truth, we've got to get into God's Word and we've got to make it a part of our lives. Let me tell you something. I have known and grown up with some fine Christian men and women some of whom are no longer in the church. They have decided to stray from the truth. They know the truth, but they've decided to stray from it. How do you do that? The only way you can stray from it is to ignore what God's Word says. That's the only way you can get away from it. If you want to live your life your way, that's fine. You go on and you live your life your way. But know that God is not happy with that. He's given you the way that you need to live. And you need to make that a part of your life. And so we need to resolve in this next year to know better 
the words of the New Testament. Apply those words and teach it. We need more teachers. We need more teachers in the Lord's church. One of the things that came up several times whenever I was going through the school was the need for elders to know the Word. I mean know the Word. And how much of an an improvement it would be on the Lord's church if it were possible for all elders to attend like a school like that. And there were some, occasionally we would have elders, you know, that would take a class. You know, elders from Carnes, they're, they're right there, and so it's easy for them to do. And I understand, everybody's got their stuff going on, you know. But if we had something like that available to our elders to help them, how much better could they help the Lord's church? Knowing, really knowing the Word of God. Third point, going back to Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 9. God says to Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Three times, three times God told him, Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Wherever you go. Seemed like, Tim, that was in that song that you read to us. Maybe we need to learn that song sometime. God is with us wherever we go. Joshua needed to know that. Whenever they were in bondage in Egypt, where was God? He was right there with them. And he proved he was right there with them. When they went to wander through the wilderness for 40 years, where was God during all that? He was right there with them and he proved that he was right there with them the whole time. Where is God going to be whenever they enter this new land, this land that they don't have any idea what's there, but they're, you know, God said he's going to give it to us, but you know, what are we going to have to face and all of that? Well, God's going to be right there with them every step of the way. He's promising Joshua, I'm going to be with you wherever you go. God will be with us when uncertainty comes in this new year. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, Paul gives us three ways. Here's a mini sermon right here in and of itself. Paul gives us three ways that God is with us wherever we go. Romans chapter 8, look at verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How is God with us wherever we go? In our prayers. God is with us in our prayers. Think about what this verse is giving us. Yes, the Holy Spirit helps us, you know, with utterances that we don't know, we don't know what to say. But, but that, to me, that's not the takeaway here. To me, the takeaway is that the Holy Spirit is there with us. In prayer, he is there in our presence when we pray to God. We wonder why prayer works? Because he's there listening. God is with us in our prayer. And then God is with us in providence. Look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. Does God work in our lives today? Absolutely he does. God's providence is at work all the time, working out his purpose, but here Paul tells us that God works it out for good to those who love God, to those who are his, to those who are called according to his purpose. God's going to work it out for your good. We don't ultimately know 
what good that is. And especially when we are in dire straits, whenever we are in that, that deep hole of stress and trouble and tribulation or whatever, however you'll call it in this world, whenever you're in that hole, it is hard to see what good can come out of this. But you know what? God knows what good. And if we will be His, if we will go to Him, He will work it out. He'll take care of it. And then God is with us in protection. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with himself also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Look down at verse 37. Y'all see that? You see that verse 37? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God is always with you everywhere you go. and He is there to help you and protect you. We need to resolve to trust in the Lord, to always know that he is there regardless of what happens. I've heard stories over the years. And I treat them as stories. Okay? I treat them as stories. Did God or Jesus actually appear to these little kids in their time of need? You know what? If he wants to, he can. But I've heard them over and over where young people are in very, very terrible circumstance and then after it's all said and done they'll say it's all right that man helped me out or that man stayed with me now, I don't I don't know how to take that all right I really don't I really don't but I know through the providence of God God takes care of us I know he protects us I've told you probably this story before, but, uh, but my aunt was uh, out West Tennessee. She was at their place of business, and there was a storm come up. There were tor- tornadoes in the storm. And she went to leave that place of work to go home, and the car wouldn't start. Never had any problem before. All of a sudden, the car won't start. Crank, 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 crank. Crank, 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 crank. She said she thought maybe it took a minute for her to get that car started. Maybe less than that. Got it started, and as she left her place of business and got on the highway, just as she got on the highway, a house rolled across the road in front of her. If that car had started, right like it always does, she'd have been in the middle of that house. God works. In this world. I don't know if that was God actually doing that. And that's the thing about providence. You can look back on it and you can say, like Paul said in in Philemon, perhaps, you know, perhaps that's why it happened. We don't know, but we know God works. We know God helps us. So we need to resolve to trust in Him that He'll be there. This year that is coming at us is uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we've got an election year. We don't have a clue what's going to happen. You know? But I know this. God has given me a promised land. And he's going to help me get there if I will simply do his will Keep his word and trust in him. 
In the Lord, we can face whatever comes in this next year. The question is, are you in the Lord? Are you in the Lord? Because all of these things that we've talked about tonight are for those who are in the Lord. How do you get in the Lord? Well, we've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He says that in John chapter 8 and verse 24. If you don't believe, you're going to die in your sins. I don't know of anybody that doesn't understand that. Who says that they're Christian. I don't know anybody that doesn't understand that. You've got to believe. And then you've got to repent. Jesus said that in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, verse, chapter 13, verse 5. You've, you've got to repent. And there again, that, now that's talking about changing your mind, changing your ways. You've got to change. You've got to change. I don't know of anybody, well, maybe a few more don't believe that. But most, most people who claim to be Christian believe that. And then he says that you've got to confess me before others. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. If you don't confess him before others, he's not going to confess you before the Father. But if you do confess him before others, he will confess you before the Father. What does that mean? That means that I need to let people know that I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And I need to let the Lord know that I understand he is my Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. We need to confess him as our Lord. There again, I don't know of anybody that would argue with that who claims to be a Christian. So why is it whenever Jesus says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, why do they have a problem with that? Beats me. Beats me. All these things are necessary to be in the Lord. What is it that puts you in the Lord? It is the act of baptism. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Is that right? Somebody nod your head. Maybe? 26, 27. Right in there. As many of you as as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you want to be in the Lord, you've got to be baptized into the Lord. You're not baptized into the church this church, you're baptized into his church. You're not baptized into a denomination. You're not baptized into a congregation. You are baptized into the Lord's church, his body. You are in the Lord. If you want to have his blessings of help and guidance, you've got to be in the Lord. This evening, if you are not in the Lord, we want to help you that with that. If you want to study more about that, you want to see more scriptures that talks about how this is the case, why is it, you know, that we don't have all these other things like, like uh, saying this sinner's prayer or just accepting Jesus in your heart as your personal Savior, I would, I would challenge you find those things in the Bible, first of all. And then when you don't find those things in the Bible, maybe we can sit down and see what's actually in the Bible. But let's study it. Let's talk about it. Let's see what it is that God wants us to do. If you have done those things, maybe there are some things in your life that has pulled you away from God. Maybe they've weakened you. You know, God said be strong and courageous. And we can be strong and courageous in the Lord with His strength if we rely on Him. Do you need to come back to Him tonight? Can we help you in any way? Won't you please come forward as we stand?